Well, excuse me, howdy, 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 out, everybody out there. This is what this is what I get for eating shelled walnuts. Little pieces getting stuck in the back of my throat, but they're so good though. We're glad you got you guys with us. Hopefully, you have your pens, your papers, your highlighters, your cups of coffee handy as we continue our journey through church history. Today, looking at the fall of Rome, as we've looked at the rise of Constantinople and the the shift of power from Rome to Constantinople and then on to Germany. But as we will also look at the same time, the rise of Islam and the rise of militant is and warlike Islam on and its effect on the Eastern Church, specifically Constantinople. As we, oh, that was weird. So some consequences of the fall of Rome. Ulrich the Visigoth sacks Rome in 410. This is something we learn in grade school when looking at world history. A large change in the course and the nature of European lifestyle, European civilization in 410. Um, Ulrich the Visigoth would have been considered a <clears throat> uncouth swine, a barbarian by all uh, contemporary understandings. And yet it's what God used to put an end to the Roman polytheistic system. And so the church by this point, as we've already seen, had already shifted power with the quote unquote Holy Roman Empire into Constantinople. After the sack of Rome, a lot of what Rome had brought to the culture and to the society um, starts to decline. We see the larger city starting to decline due to lack of trade. Because of the scare of the barbarians, those coming from Tarsus or what we would know of as England and Ireland stopped coming to parts of Europe because of the barbarian um, influence and aggression. The social situation turns into fiefdoms and structured classes of people. This is where we start getting the class system that shows up in England um, up until, you know, considerably recent history with your social situation and status depending upon how much land you own and how many people you have working your land giving you your title, giving your position and stature in the community, and often by which you accumulate your wealth. Now, because there's lack of trade, everybody's social and financial situation declines. Um, also, at the same time, you start to have, because the church is in decline, because of not only the sack of Rome in 410, the church has moved to Constantinople, and now... Just a few centuries after the fall of Rome, you see a decline in the churches because of the monastic movement, a decline of education, both within and with outside of the church. So your monks have very little educational requirements and or training. The priests that are in charge over individual churches being required less and less to learn original languages such as Greek and Hebrew and more of a focus upon the Latin and the Vulgate. So much so that this lack of education that's if within the church and those in, in leadership in the church have less and less of an education, then less and less of an education is going out to your common everyday person who sometimes was coming to the church for an education. At this point, because of the lack of education, and the change in the the worship of the church, sermons are reduced to 10-minute homilies, sometimes even less than that. So the amount of liturgy or the amount of tradition goes up, and the amount of how much the word is either spoken of 
or you know, I I can't even call homilies preaching. Homilies as I was growing up in the Roman Catholic Church by my great grandma's house in Long Beach, California was nothing more than literally the priest took the the morning newspaper and talked about current situations with the president or with the pope. It wasn't, hey, get your Bibles. We're going to talk about Revelation chapter 3 today. It was about the current situation. And this, this is nothing new. This has been happening since the fall of Rome. And since this big exchange and change in the culture in Europe, uh, starting in the 4th century. So, yes, Roman Catholic priests still go to seminary. But it's going to seminary to learn the doctrine of the church. Yes, they do learn some ancient languages, but many of them quickly forget them. And they learn how to do the system of the Roman Catholic Church, not the faith of the Roman Catholic Church. And at this time, because sermons and the focus on the word is reduced to 10 minutes per in, in the service, and the emphasis on the sacramental part, the, the sacrifice, the propitiatory sacrifice of the Mass, the, the veneration of saints, and, and all these other things, comes more and more into play within the church. Educational aids are start to being brought into the church. Now, originally, this was not meant for that. This was not meant to change doctrine. But over the centuries and millennia, it has. Originally, as they realized that the culture around them was less literate, especially post the fall of Rome, the surrounding culture around them was less literate. And so then they start bringing in sculpture and paintings and statues and stained glass to help describe the stories of the Bible, to describe Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. But because of the reduction of God's word and an inflation of tradition and specifically sacramentalism, then these educational aids over the next couple, only a couple hundred years, once you enter about 650, you see people starting to bow down and to worship to proskuneo, these images and paintings and statues, which then leads to the Great Schism in 1045. Another consequence of the fall in Rome is that as mankind continues to grow, we have to realize the fact that Rome, by the time Rome is sacked, they had indoor plumbing. Or they at very least had um, bathhouses and um, restrooms, public restrooms with um, flowing water to get rid of the refuse, to create a more sanitary environment. But then as we fast forward just another 30 years, we start to see then a decline in the cleanliness of society. So much so because of the advent of the, the desert church fathers and just before this period, dualism comes into play. The, the idea that the physical is bad, that the spiritual is good, and that because of that, then people would neglect their physical well-being and consider it godliness. You know, we looked at earlier some early church fathers, desert church fathers, who thought that because they had maggots and stuff in their teeth and in their beards, that they were ever so holy. Um, there's a saint that considered it a, a spiritual gift that she had never taken a bath in her life. These conditions, both the asceticism of the monks and then the decline in cleanliness as a culture means that modern day researchers are finding that the first plague didn't hit Europe in the 1300s is actually in 540. 
Uh, they're identifying it as the Rattus Rattus Plague. But it only lasted for about a year and didn't hit Europe as heavily as it would in the following millennia because it needed more population to continue to spread. But we're seeing from DNA evidence and, and that that we're able to get from corpses and, and that in the ground, that those alive during this time were exposed to the first major plague um, in 540. This bringing about because of the lack of cleanliness, the lack of culture, the lack of education. Now we fast forward in talking about this first plague obviously brings up our collective memory, so to speak, of the plagues in Europe between the 13th to the 16th centuries. Now, these had mortality rates that widely varied. See, here in America, we're freaking out because of COVID that has a less than a 1% mortality rate. Oh, I know. I know, Dave. Talk about smelling bad. Well, that's why later those who are rich would have snuff boxes, a little box, kind of like an Altoids box in which they would have a powdery material that would they would sniff in their noses to help to alleviate the, the stench of others. But the mortality rates for right now COVID is less than 1%. So you have over a 99% chance of surviving COVID now, we do know that right now there are several different strands of COVID with a little bit different mortality rates and infection rates. But overall, you've got better than a 99% chance unless you have underlying symptoms to survive it versus the mortality rates of the plague between the plague that hit in 540, which we don't know exactly what the mortality would have been because of lack of records about those who were either alive or had died at the time. But we do know of the mortality rates of the plagues that would come in the following millennia. Those that had gotten the bubonic plague, uh, at least 70%, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the community, was your mortality rate. If you got it, 70% of the people died. If you got the pneumonic plague, it's actually 90 plus percent. You're Unless, even in modern times, if you get the pneumonic plague where get, the infection gets into your lungs, unless you get it, you immediately go to the doctors and start the antibiotics, you have a 10% chance of living, even with the medicine. Without the medicine, it's more like a 99% mortality rate. You're going to die. And even more so, through the records, if you were bitten by an infected animal, we know that these plagues come from the mites that are on rats um, that are ever so prevalent in ancient societies because of their lack of cleanliness. If you were bitten by an infected animal, it was you were going to die, and you were going to die within 12 hours. So consequently, because of the mortality rates, because only three out of 10 live births resulted in a child coming to adult age. Because of these different morbidity factors, life was short. You had a different appreciation for life because you had a lot more miscarriages. You had a lot of more children that did not live through infancy. You had a lot, uh, your life expectancy during these middle ages was less than it is today because of all of these factors. Because of this, your look on, your outlook on faith and life was vastly different. Today, where, you know, if somebody dies in their 70s and 80s, we think they're kind of young. We think that, oh, wow, a, a baby died in, in infancy or uh, a mother had a miscarriage, that that's the abnormality has only been the last hundred years. People that lived in this, the dark ages or the middle ages 
had a different lease on life, that they understood that life was fleeting and their, then their need for God was more. But now that mankind is so reliant upon himself, their need for God has reduced through the ages rather than increased. We see this play out in churches across um, Europe and the United States, especially in the West. As the reliance upon man increases, the reliance upon God decreases. So we come to Islam. Now, you will notice that we are going to be jumping up and down in the timeline because we're dealing with so vastly ge both geographic and cultural areas in church history, whether it's east or west and, and the cultures and the peoples and the rulers at those times that sometimes we have to go two steps forward and one step back in order to get a, a larger picture. The same thing is true with Islam. We are starting. We have been looking at church councils and church histories right up until the Second um, Nicene Council, but we have to take about a century and a half step back to look at Islam and the rise of Islam and its challenge against the church in both the East with Constantinople and eventually with the church in the West centered in Germany. Muhammad, you can spell his name several different ways, but we'll use this one for, for this. His dates are 570 to 632. Um, he had written, supposedly, the Quran, which is supposedly the dictation by an angel and inspiration given to Muhammad to write down. Then there are what's called the Hadith. as an oral history of Muhammad and his teachings. There are several different collections of these hadith, depending upon your denomination, shall we say, within Islam, whether you're Sunni or Shiite, whether you are conservative or liberal, will determine which set of hadith are considered authentic and or permissible. Um, the two in which are probably the most well-known are Sahih al-Bakari and Sahih Muslim, uh, the two largest and specifically Sunni um, hadith are most Muslims in America would study one of these two particular sets of hadith or oral stories. Um, as Dr. White says, the Shiite hadith get kind of crazy, and they do. The uh, Shiite get, hadith getting more mystical and magical and fantastical as they go on. We are going to give a very small overview of Muhammad and Islam and leading us up to their military dominance in the Middle East, rising northward to the church in the east and Constantinople, and then as it heads west. And, and captures large chunks of Europe, such as Spain and Portugal. And it's then it's challenged to the church as it the church moves e west towards Germany. Then you have the challenge of the the Vikings and the Visigoths from the north, and the challenge of Islam from the south and from the east. The place in which the Muslims consider the most holy place is in Mecca. It's called the Akaba, a small oblong temple, so-called from its cubic form. We have to remember in Muhammad's life, his dad was a pagan priest. Kind of familiar story to Abraham, right? His father was a pagan priest, and his family was in charge of the Kaaba. At before Muhammad, the Kaaba was full of different household deities. Many of the Babylonian um, myth gods were in it. As Muhammad gains power, he takes control over the Kaaba and throws out all the idols, except um, except for one major 
shall we say, idle, which we're going to look at in a moment. To it, the faces of millions of Muslims are dev devoutly turned into prayer five times a day. You are to face Mecca. You are to face the Kaaba in prayer five times a day as one of the pillars of Islam. It is enclosed by the great mosque, which corresponds in importance to the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem and St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. It can also hold about 35,000 persons. Now, this was written originally in the 1880s. Today, um, from what I've heard, uh, can the area surrounding Mecca and the tent cities that surrounds it can hold millions that come to come worship because it's demanded at least once in your life if you were physically or um, financially able to do so to make a pilgrimage to Mecca and to worship at the Kaaba. It is surrounded by colonnades, chambers, and domes and minarets. Near it is the bubbling well of Zamzem, from which Hagar and Ishmael are said to have quenched their burning thirst. Now, this is once again tradition, and we have to realize that the main difference between Islam and Judaism is that Judaism follows the, the patriarch Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Muslims follow after Ishmael as their patron. We, they would deny the curse upon um, Ishmael and those of his descendants. Um, they would say that it is, in fact, instead um, Isaac that had the curse. And so there's this disagreement about the history of these two nations. The Kaaba is much older than Mecca. Diodorus Siculus mentions it is the oldest and most honored temple in his time, this being in the Roman period uh, preceding Muhammad. It's supposed to have been first built by angels in the shape of a tent and to have been let down from heaven. There, Adam supposedly worshipped after his expulsion from paradise. Seth substituted a structure of clay and stone for a tent. After the destruction of the, by the deluge, Abraham and Ishmael reconstructed it, and their footsteps are supposedly shown on the inside of the Kaaba. Now, only the inside of the Kaaba are the highest levels of imams within Islam allowed to go into. It's one of those like the Masonic Lodge and the Mormon temples that there's layers of secrecy as regarding to what is inside of it. It was entirely rebuilt in 1627. And in 1627, it, is, it was found that it contained the famous black stone, which is in these days covered by great tapestries that covered the entire building of the Kaaba. In the northeastern corner near the door, it's estimated that this is probably a meteoric stone, in other words, a meteor fallen from the sky, that was placed at the corner of the building of the Kaaba and served originally as an altar. The Arabs believed that it fell from paradise with Adam and it was white as milk, but turned to black on account of man's sins. This is the idol by which Islam worships at the feet of this cornerstone, this meteoric stone there at the Kaaba, along with whatever other idols still remain inside of the Kaaba. There is supposedly, according to tradition, items belonging to Muhammad, including uh, early copies of the Quran, inside of the building of the Kaaba. Muhammad subsequently cleared the Kaaba of all relics of idolatry and made it the place of pilgrimage for his followers. <gasps> Excuse me. He in invented or re revived the legend that Abraham, by divine command, sent his son Ishmael with Hagar to Mecca to establish there the true worship and the pilgrim festival. He says in the Quran, God has appointed the Kaaba 
the sacred house to be a station for mankind. And yet we do not read anywhere except for in the Quran that comes uh, many millennia, approximately 1600 years, no, yeah, at least 1600 years after the completion of the Old Testament. None of the books that were sealed up in the temple at, at the time of the Maccabees ever mentioned the Kaaba or Isaac or Ishmael's journey to the Kaaba. It just says that they were sent away. And remember, when we appointed the sanctuary as man's resort and safe retreat, and said, Take ye the station of Abraham for a place of prayer. And we commanded Abraham and Ishmael, Purify my house for those who shall go in procession around it, and those who shall bow down and prostrate themselves. To me, once again, my Muslim friends would disagree with this. This sounds like idol worship. This sounds like much like the veneration of the saints or the worship of images that we do not bow down in front of an image or an idol or a stone to worship God, that we worship him directly. These myths regarding Abraham and Ishmael um, are not found anywhere in history, only in the recitation of the Quran and the Hadith, um, not found within any, any Jewish sources or even uh, Middle Eastern sources, even after the time of Muhammad. Some of the origins of Islam in Africa, which lead to the situations in which we have today. I'm sure our brothers and sisters in Africa can... Uh, give evidence to this history. Uh, Muhammadism has inflamed the simple-minded African tribes with an, the impure fire of fanaticism and given them greater power of resistance to Christianity. Now, you guys have to remember that this was written in the late 1800s. That even at this point, in, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, those writing about the effect of Islam in Africa understood its violent tendencies. We all, all we have to look is the last hundred years of the civil wars based on religion, specifically Islam within the continent of, of Africa. And still to this day, how the terrorists who proclaim a Islamic ideology use Islam as a justification for their terrorism. How they slaughter villages, take the men to e either murder the men or take them to being soldiers, and then rape and pillage the re and set it ablaze. We have seen that as missionaries have been sent to Africa, that the rise of Islam has been the most brutal than any of the ungodly and secular tribes had ever been towards the missionaries. Islam has been even more violent and brutal towards Christians in Africa than in almost any other nation. Sir William Muir, a very competent judge, thinks that Muhammadism by the poisoning influence of polygamy and slavery and by the crushing all freedom of judgment and religion has interposed the most effectual barrier against the reception of Christianity. So for my friends saying that the white man is the big evil in Africa over the last, let's just say 300 years, it started well before that. As Islam hits Africa in the 8th century, it brought polygamy and slavery, that the, the judicial laws of Islam allow for slavery, in which then the tribes that were overran by Islam were able to sell into slavery the captives of those cities, in which eventually, as the centuries would go on, not only were sent to Europe and to Asia, but also then to England and the United States. 
So the the evils of slavery aren't all, and I'm not reducing any of the negativity of the, the bad white man, but also the influence of Islam gave rise to slavery within the African nations and which allowed them and gave them a law and a rule by which it was customary, by which it was normal to have that type of slavery. And then as it is mentioned here, as Sir William Muir says, that it crushed all freedom of judgment in religion. It's either you are Muslim or you are dead. And it has become the most the biggest barrier against the reception of Christianity in Africa. This was written in the 1880s. No systems, Muir says, could have been devised with more consummate skill for shouting out, shutting out the nations over which it has sway. From the light of the truth, idolatrous Arabs might have been aroused to spiritual life and to the adoption of faith of Jesus. Mondamian Arabia is, to the human eye, sealed against the benign influences of the gospel. The sword of Muhammad and the Quran are the most fatal enemies of civilization, liberty, and truth. We don't have to take William Muir's, Sir William Muir's assessment of Islam in Africa to see its effect in history. This is just a a slice of the pie, as it were, as to the violent and countercultural war Islam has brought to the African nation and then to the rest of the world. Um, he's so true when he says the sword of Muhammad and the Quran are the most fatal enemies of civilization, liberty, and truth. Our presidents in the late 1800s and early 1900s saw and marked Islam out as a great evil and danger that if it ever came to America would be part of its undoing. Because of its true call to slay the infidel and to um, tax and to enslave Christians and Jews has been the biggest enemy of civilization. Our The second generation of presidents, not the founding fathers, but those that would come after that first generation passes away from um, Lincoln on, understood the challenge of Islam coming to America and tried to protect against it. Now, what we experience more often is a Sunni a liberal form of Sunnism that really denies a lot of the tenets and or the passages of the Quran that have in previous centuries and in our own time given rise to groups such as Al-Qaeda and Boko Haram and all these other groups that they are ideologically different there's this liberal form of Islam that wants to do their prayers and to um, wear more more modern clothing and, and to keep some of the laws, but to reject others because of their association with Shiitism or with um, strict literal Islam. So most people in America have an interaction with more of an unbelieving cultural Islam than a believing literalist Islam. We have to realize that those are two vastly different things. The Islam of Africa is not the Islam of the United States. The Islam in the Middle East is not the Islam of Africa and isn't the Islam of the United States. So some of the dates and times as we look at Islam and, and maybe in the future, you know, Lord willing, I will do a series on digging deeper into the origins and the teachings of Islam. But for right now, all we need to a cursory view 
that in 57 Muhammad is born. And supposedly in 610 Muhammad received the vision of from Jibril, as they say, Gabriel, and began his career as a prophet. Huh. Well, at least Muhammad got the name of an, an angel right, unlike Joseph Smith. And, and why um, uh, the Mormons paint uh, the angel Moroni as Ric Flair from the WWE, I have no idea. He receives these visions from Gabriel, which begin his right or is dictating the Quran to those that are around him. The Haggidah or the flight of Muhammad from Mecca to Medina, beginning of the what's called the Mohammedan era, um, when he sets up, takes over his dad's position as high priest of in Mecca. And that he goes to Medina and starts to basically rally the troops to creating his army that then goes and marches and conquers basically country after country after country in the Middle East, heading northwards towards Constantinople. In 632, Muhammad dies. And al bakr is the first caliph or successor of Muhammad in 632. We see then starting a condensing of the Quran in a written form in the, in, in the 600s. Um, we see revisions then being included and then the writing down of the Hadith. In 636, the, the pressure westward in which Jerusalem is then captured by Caliph Omar. In 640, they capture Alexandria in Egypt as they head south. Thurk crosses the straits from Africa into Europe and calls the mountain Jebel Tariq, Gibraltar. You know, Gibraltar right off, right between France and England. The Battle of Pontiers and Tours. Abd de Rahman defeated by Charles Martel in Western Europe, saved from the Muslim conquest. So from this period, from 636 to 732, a century of Islamic aggression on all fronts, north and west and south, not so much east. Maybe um, Abakar had enough sense as to not try and go into India or into China or into Russia. Maybe he'd played risk. Maybe he knew that, you know, trying to attack Russia in winter is not a good idea. In 786 to 809, Harun al-Rashad, Caliph of Baghdad, in what's called the Golden Era of Muhammadism, the then you start to see an increase in the mathematics and the astronomy and the what I would call cultural Islam, then coming from this time in which they had controlled Spain and Gibraltar and, um, of course, the Middle East, large portions of northern Africa, which had been a pillar of Christianity, you remember. Up until this point, that when Alexandra falls in 640, up to that point, it had been a stronghold of Christianity. By which, up until recent times, a lot of what's called the Alexandrian text type of the Greek New Testament had been written and copied many, many times. From which we get the concept of the Library of Alexandria, which had been burned, and that knowledge had been lost. That the collapse of Christian Egypt by Islam begins to rock the world. Then as relative peace comes, they've captured Jerusalem, they have Alexandria, they've gone all the way up to, to pressing against um, Constantinople. And then if Constantinople is to fall, the rest of Rome, or excuse me, well, the rest of the 
Holy Roman Empire then would fall. That if Constantinople falls, the, the kingdom falls. That then as pressure is coming up from the south and the west, and then the north and east, if it falls, Christianity is in a big hurt against from Islam. From which these events, all the way into the ninth century, is what is becomes the beginnings of the sentiment towards Islam negatively from Christians that fuels the fire of the Crusades. We're, we're not going to get into the Crusades yet. We're still pre-split East and West, in the Great Schism of 1045, but we will get there. We will get there. But we must look at the, the origins of Islam and its challenge against Christianity in these early centuries to understand, truly understand the need and the purpose of the Crusades in which now many Westerners are trying to be forced into saying that the Crusades were unnecessary and an evil and this or that, but they're but at the same time denying the fact that violent radical Islam spread across by the march of armies across Northern Africa, across Southern Europe, uh, across Eastern Europe, and that many were were either uh, accept Muhammad as their prophet or die by the sword. To deny that is to deny history. That is why we're studying church history. We're studying what happened and what is the cause and effects of these things. They last until today, in which we're being told to deny the fact that, in fact, that uh, Omar captures Alexandria and captures Jerusalem and the bloody battles that occurred, that the Battle of Gibraltar was also a very ugly deal. That in fact, that in France, the the battles between Albert Rahman and Charles Martel, who we had already looked at, at the beginning of the Mor Moravian kings, really saved most of Europe from Muslim conquest. They would have, if they could have, marched all the way from Saudi Arabia all the way north to England. And all the way east, as much as either Russia or the um, Chinese would have let them. But thankfully, God's providence put a stop to it. In which then, from 800 until the beginning of the Crusades, a century later, we start to see there's a relative peace and, and the growth of culture. But then once again, the, the call to arise by the caliph to violent Islam, receive Islam or die becomes the call. With that, it's the end of our lesson for today. Hopefully, prayerfully, you guys are starting con to connect the dots between what's going east and west and even south in this case as to what's going on in the church, which leads to effects that last till today. May God bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you peace as you enjoy him today. Bye, y'all.